peace what's going down hope everybody's well um if you've followed me for a while you would know that years ago i wasn't all that big of a fan of online beat leasing i've done a lot of apologizing i've done a lot of repenting for that and obviously i'm all about it now and I've been meaning to make a video explaining how my life and how my career changed since I started licensing Beats. Since I attended my first uh, Beat Stars event, I actually moderated it, uh, and that was a couple of years ago. And I wanted to reflect on my experiences both working uh, to get placements in you know, the quote unquote music industry. Everything's in the music industry, but when you say the music industry, people often think major labels and big time artists. So I do eventually want to talk about, you know, the, the differences for me in my life and in my career. But that's not what this video is. This video is a conversation with DJ A, who's obviously quite qualified. If you if you look at his resume, he's a producer who has uh, worked with Diplo to the point where he's been accused of being Diplo's ghost producer. Trust me, we talk about that in the video. So if you're selling beats online, if you're looking to license beats in film, TV, commercials, and if you wanna soak up some knowledge from somebody who's done it all, you will enjoy this conversation. These live conversations go down on beatstars.live every Monday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They're completely free. You can log on, you can interact, you can ask questions live. Hope to see you there. For now, shout out to DJ A for having this conversation. Hope you enjoy it. Peace. Let's be honest, you're not gonna find these videos anywhere else. Why? Because I make them. So it would really help me out if you subscribe. If you've already subscribed, what also really helps is if you like the video and leave a comment. It's hard in the era of clickbait videos on YouTube and negativity in the producer community. And I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Breaking the conversation, Bufo has a question <laughs> about um, your, your I think I think your, your brief mention of the pop sessions really, uh, kind of slapped a lot of people in the face um <laughs> so he's asking what if as a producer you don't play any instruments and you show up to a session from your experience will one get laughed at ignored kicked out am i being paranoid at this point i think a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about these these sessions I, you know i mean this is my experience generally um i would someone would say you know hey there's a, a top line writer you know vocal writer essentially i I, these terms I think are so dumb, but a top line writer is a person who writes lyrics um, and melodies and they essentially will listen to instrumental tracks or they'll sit with you and make a track and they will write the lyrics and the top line melody while you're going. Um, so a lot of times it would be like, hey, we're going to pair you with another producer and then a writer or we're going to pair you with two writers and another producer. So, you know, it wasn't like you were going to get laughed out. But you really did need to be like, you just had to have, you just had to be firing on all cylinders. You, you had to have beats. You had to have, hey, maybe this is what I've been up to lately. Um, oh, here, I've got some cool drums. Oh, here. I mean, this is what I do now. I send stuff out to other producers and artists and I say, hey, here's some stuff for you, your team to work with. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm a collaborator, but like, here's some stuff. So that was the thing. I had to have loops. I had to have drums. I had to be able to do, I mean, one thing in Ableton that I would be, ha it's a pretty simple thing, but I would be happy to show it. This is a cool story. So this has n nothing, this doesn't really have anything to do with the pop stuff, but maybe five years ago or something, I was with um, Jack Harlow. Uh, I've known Jack a long time. He's doing so, I mean, he's just so impressive. And yeah, a thing he's top, he has a top 10 signal right now. That's unbelievable. Crazy. I mean, it's just, the beat is so, as soon as I heard the piano, which I've, I'm, I've learned from a video he put up as J.W. Lucas, as soon as I heard the piano, I was just like, oh my God, this beat is perfect for his voice. Yeah, it's and, dope. And, and, and anyways, so I've known him a long time and uh, I was with him here in Louisville. This is when he was still in high school and he had one of my beats and he was recording and he was like, hey, man, you know, um, I like this, but can you switch it? You know, can we do like a switch up part, like a different beat or whatever? And he was kind of had the idea of how it might go. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. And I put headphones on and sat on the couch. And in Ableton, you can just drag either an entire project or individual tracks from a project into the project you're working on. So this is something I do all the time. This is a, a, a perfect example of why I make a dozen ideas a day and keep them around because I could say, hey, you know, I'm just gonna bring this whole thing in here and then the entire session drops in underneath what's already there. 
or I can just bring in like an individual instrument. And I sat down on the couch and knew what he wanted and went to another beat that I had and brought the drums in and did it in like less than three minutes. And he was like, just, what, what, you know, like how, there's no way you made that beat. Like I made the beat, but like, I just put it together. Like I didn't have to sit here and like draw all the damn hi-hats out or whatever, you know what I mean? Mm. So that is what I mean by that's my version of versatile is really having your your ammo having your arsenal ready so that you know you've got your got your melodic stuff you've got your um you know you've got different you know uh, this is something that my dad was always obsessed with and he was totally right my dad played music my family or some musical people um and he always had a thing when i was a kid where he was like you know the best songs can generally be just like played or sang with no instrumentation and they're still really good. And that maybe doesn't apply to every genre of music, but essentially it is really true that when you break something down super simple, if it's still really good, it's gonna be good no matter how produced it is or whatever, you know? Um, and that's exactly what I mean. I like to try to have songs, even if it's just piano, you know, just basic arrangements and stuff. Um, and that was always one of my strengths when I was trying to do the pop thing is that even though I might not be able to like jump on the piano and be a virtuoso, I knew I had all my tools and I knew how to how to deploy them quickly. That sounds really, really corny. But I knew, you know, I knew how to like mm. put pieces together really fast and be confident in it, not be just like, oh, hi hats, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, let me how quickly can I do these drums? Um I would have just loops ready, you know, and it was always definitely my thing where even though I wasn't a Berkeley Academy of Music graduate, I was able to kind of keep up with people. Um, and that that really ties into the film with like kind of the sync stuff, the film and licensing and commercial music. The people that I work with in that arena are just I mean, I, I've had the absolute pleasure of working with Mark Mothersbaugh over the last few years. Mark Mothersbaugh was the founder of that band Devo, the Whippet band, um, mm -hmm. the like 80s new wave band. But he went on to score, um, to write the scores for like the Rugrats, um, tons yeah. of other early Nickelodeon stuff. Then he did like all these films and now he does all these great animated films that my daughter, my daughter loves Hotel Transylvania. He's done all three Hotel Transylvanias. So I've had the honor of working with Mark or with his team on like commercial music at various times over the years. And it's not because I'm a virtuoso musician because they are, they really are like the people that work for him are dudes that can like write score. They're seriously like Juilliard, whatever the hell. Um, but the reason that I, that they liked me is because I was able to bring my little thing to the table and I was able to do it quickly and efficiently and I was easy to be around or whatever. You know what I mean? So it's, it's de it, like I say, jack of all trades, it can be bad because you can be mediocre at all trades, mm. but you still have to like, if you really want to compete, I think you really have to try to, you know, be versatile, but confident in those lanes and like really know when to, when to break them out. You know, I don't know. I was smirking while you were talking about the ghost producer conversation because I actually have two tweets pulled up and one of them is and I hate that I'm doing this. It's back in 2015. Oh yeah, I've tried I've tried to be a much more <laughs> chill guy. I used to be such a cynical jerk. Yeah, well you turned up a little bit. I just want to read it. It's it's a, it's a, it's a it maybe so Oh I, I want to know what what led up to this because your tweet November 5th, 2015 said maybe if some of these Idiot kids actually read liner notes. I wouldn't hear all this ghost producer bullshit. And, and that's not fair. It's not a. It's not a. Um, it's not a consumer of of the arts responsibility. I was so happy when Spotify put credits in. You know what I mean? Like that's really what it's about. It's just yeah. credits and streaming services. Credit. You know, a little bit better credits on YouTube. I've often argued Wikipedia is a real shithole in terms of credits. You can kind of just oh, make yeah. up whatever you want. I, you know, so. Th that was so so false so false that's just me being an asshole and 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 being older but what it is is then as a few years went on now you can go on to the little wayne song i produced and my name is right there you just right click it or whatever or it's on apple music i think it's under the lyrics yeah 
great. That's all. That was really that was just me being stupid because what I should have been saying was, I look forward to the day it will come. I look forward to the day when the uh, the information is out there because I like liner notes. I mean, at most. Most yeah. people who are pretty nerdy about music like liner notes. You know what I mean? So it's something that people want. Um, I think with the Little Wayne record that I did on the Carter 4, the Carter 4 actually had a PDF liner note with the iTunes purchase, which was sick. Maybe that's where yeah. I was being shitty, saying, hey, you dumb kids, you need to go read your PDF, which is still pretentious and stupid. <laughs> At the same time, in your defense, though, what a lot of people will do is they'll comment on something without even investigating. And so... I think a lot of people had this idea in their in their heads that, you know, in order to be, if you're a Diplo, if you're a Kelvin Harris, if you're a um, who are a, a, a David Guetta, you know, whoever you are, this is your name. These are your records, and these are guys who have transcended the role of producer. They're now just artists. They're not recording artists. They're not producers. They're not DJs. They are artists. And their brands, more importantly, mm -hmm. and and their their music icons. Um, so I think even in this chat, someone said, "Wait, I th I thought Diplo produced everything himself." I mean, he does. That's what you know. Brian Wilson, uh, whatever yeah. Quincy Jones produced everything. It doesn't mean that he got down and played the fucking bass guitar, you know. <laughs> and that yeah, and that's what I'm getting at. So beat making and producing, I I try to shy away from the conversation that pits producers versus beat makers because we know especially in the hip-hop world they've just been used interchangeably because that's how it is we took the band element out of music creation and we are the band and oftentimes we are the producers as well but when you talk about nowadays i think it's evolved so much and there's so much more collaboration so it's like are you co-writers technically you're a co-writer if you if you help produce the beat or create the beat or maybe you're a producer of the beat sometimes you're a producer of the song sometimes you're a vocal producer and you maybe didn't play a single key or program totally. a single drum note totally. so it's it's all over the place right and yep. so yep. i think that's a conversation that needs to be had but it's hard to have it in in a respectful way uh without people reacting getting angry because you know their ideas of of how music is created and and you know become shattered or or these terms that we use the term producer is so contentious it could mean so many different things which is a pretty common thing we always have like a colloquial term that kind of means 10 different things however i i say we is just like a modern pop culture kind of a thing you know what i mean like uh, i think it, it goes along with movies and stuff too people don't have any idea what a producer does i I've, I've worked on movies and i still barely know exactly what the producer does all the time you know what i mean mm -hmm. like yeah and i mean work on movies like i had the opportunity to work on some local productions here um because i was thinking about trying to get more into that the, those productions are are not going on now for all sorts of different reasons but i was considering trying to get back into the film sound stuff and i was looking at the product uh the the production side instead of the post-production side and um Still, it the the terms are somewhat interchangeable. Some of them don't even make sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some, especially on movies, the, a lot of those terms, like a grip, or a best boy or whatever, they don't do anything even vaguely like what that term was invented. Or even just the term music publishing means publishing uh, sheet music. If yeah, I'm not mechanical mistaken. royalties means yeah. publishing a mechanical uh, piece for the for the player pianos. So it's yeah. So it's always like we're always using terms colloquially. I think that's the correct what I mean to say. We're using terms, and not only do they have ten different meanings, but they don't even really have anything to do with where the where the word came from. <laughs> anyway. So I guess the point is just you know, don't get angry about it. It's it's all good. Um, it, there's I guess I mean, let's. <laughs> So let's. I, this is more me just because we're and I. You can you can leave anytime. We're already we're already beyond our allotted hour of time. I, I'm 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 so happy. This is this is fun. Just let me know when you want to stop, man. Because I love talking about this stuff. Um, because you and I we've known each other on the internet a long time, and I often chime in on Twitter a little bit and stuff because I know how pissed off music sucks. I mean, it's hard. I've been doing it a long. It sucks. It's hard. It's hard to make money. It is hard to get people to cut you in. 
it is hard to understand the publishing. I don't understand it. I mean, I do my best, but I'm yeah. not like, I mean, I can't do it all. I'm pretty good, but I have to sit down and make beats. I can't just read music business books all day. So if, if uh, you have said this a lot, you had better want to do it. Yeah. That's just all there is to it because I'm I'm not gonna lie, dude. After my daughter was born in 2014, I had a couple of years where I didn't do anything, and everything I made was terrible. Like I thought I, I thought I was done, man. I worked with Lana Del Rey and her producer. Uh, I didn't work with Lana one on one. I worked with her producer, um, this guy Rick Knowles. And I was like, oh man, this is great. I'm gonna like go into this whole new world. I'm gonna be a, a beat guy. In and then she went and hired like Metro and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that's because of me. I'm just saying that that wasn't fun. But you just got. I I went back to making beats one day or whatever, or or immediately went back to making beats because that's what I do and that's what I want to do. Period. With my free time, you know what I mean. Like it does not matter if I was gonna ever work with Lana Del Rey or whoever ever again. I was gonna do it just because I wanted to it's fun you know so i that to me that's that's it you're gonna get screwed i've been screwed and i mean i've been doing this a long time i still get screwed everybody gets screwed that's just how it goes you just have to be like well okay and try to not get screwed the next time you know yeah i've been or, or i've been quit. thinking about that a lot um <laughs> lately because i'm not i'm not quitting uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, I I was the I was the industry guy. I wanted placements, placements, placements. Yeah, right, um, right. And and I I'm I'm relating a lot to your story because my whole thing was all of a sudden I'm introduced to this whole new world that had existed right in front of me for years, and it wasn't real to me. The whole online space wasn't real to me. It was you know internet producers. What is that? Right. And then I met them and I'm like, not only are these guys really talented, but they don't even have placements and they're living better lives than I am. They're happier. That goes so, back I mean, to some of them do. That goes back to that me showing the finder window, showing that I made the beat in July and it didn't come out until on a Diplo record until uh, I don't know, February the following year. And then I didn't get paid in February. I still had yeah. to wait. That's I've heard Decap talk about this on some of the podcasts he's done lately. Um, huge fan of him. He's to me, he whatever. He, he's the type of guy that is from my little corner of the weird EDM ish. I, I feel like it all goes back to people like Mr. Carmack, Soul Action, stuff like that. We're hip hop beat makers, but we're also yeah. kind of like whatever. Which is but crazy because I knew him from MySpace, and then all of a sudden he's living in my city <laughs> for a period, and then he's in my house trying to show me Ableton. Really? <laughs> and we made a beat, and then I think we sold it like a week later, and that was it. He moved, um, and now That's he's crazy. like the biggest sound designer <laughs> well, yeah, on it's Splice. Like I, I was aware of him. I never really met him because I was uh, around when Mr. Carmack got going and Jemba Jemba was going, and they were doing the um, – what the hell was their thing? The team – whatever they had like a label thing it was when the dudes were really starting to make creative beats that slapped instead mm -hmm. of just like weird stuff you know what i mean <laughs> instead of just being weirdo it was like banger mr carmack shit that you could rap or sing over or, or just stood on its own um and i started hearing about decap and then i knew about the drums and then it was like every producer that i got to know and would maybe meet up with in la were like oh yeah he's my best friend and i'd be like really <laughs> it seemed like everybody knew him except for me but anyways recently on some podcasts he talked about how much it sucks to wait for money to come through from placements like yeah. i love placements i love rap music i love hearing people turn my beat into a song or whatever but i don't love waiting eight months to get paid the idea that that you can you should you can and should be your own artist and be trying to make that work because i did not do that i did not do it right i released records i tried to have projects but it it, it wasn't me just making my own brand i was i did a thing called totally crossed out we played at south by southwest after diplo at like five in the morning we wore frog masks um 
Kid Cudi got on stage with us. We were on the fader like the next day. I was like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to be, it's going to be amazing. My life's going to change. It absolutely did not. It just fizzled. It just fizzled. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the timing of projects, having that management and A&R mindset and not just, you know, thinking of it as a product that has to be sold at the right time to the right people but it also goes back to the fact that i was doing a project with masks on <laughs> i wasn't telling anyone that it was me so people know who i am but i don't have like a hundred thousand plays on spotify a month I, and that's a shame i i easily could have nurtured that so people sh- and i'm gonna i'm doing it now there's no reason to not do it now but sure. you, if you're 20 you have to do it immediately. There's no question. You need to be Kenny Beats plus one. You need to be uh, Clams Casino. There's kind of going back a little bit. Or Mr. Carmack. You have to be a dude who works with artists but is an artist. You know, and, and don't wear a mask and make up a fake rave thing and then not tell people who you are for four years. That's a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah, it works for one out of a million people. And then everyone thinks, well, I'm just going to do that. And but anyway, um, God, yeah. So to to extend what you were saying about the whole placement thing, I went through this long period just trying to, because once I met all the online guys and once, you know, BeatStars got the co-sign from Mike Trampy, I'm like, I got to listen to Mike Trampy. He's my oldest friend in the business. Uh, I just... I wanted to see if I could do it. And then, you know, Abe's in my ear talking about, why aren't you making more money? You should be doing this making more money these guys there are guys out here you know making 10 20 thousand a month i'm like no way absolutely not no one's making that and then i meet the people that are doing it and they're just casually comparing their sales i'm like how the hell and then on top of it i'm listening to their beats i'm like jesus christ these guys are amazing (laughs) yeah that's a great feeling right (laughs) they were yeah so i'm sitting there like (laughs) what am i gonna do Right, you know, and then oh, I, I know that you're just you hear some. Uh, I used to walk in and hear Mr. Carmack working on something at this old Diplo studio and just be like, F- I, f- I give up, I'm done. Yeah. What the fuck? I've, I've I don't even I got a four bar loop in the other room. This guy's in here, like, uh, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> like, but, but the beautiful thing is, <laughs> um, what I realized is I'm in the room with these guys. And, you know, I'll say names, Beat Demons, Dream Life. Oh, Beat, um, yeah, Beat Demons, Dream Life. So good. All, the, all these guys. And, like, now, Dream Life and I, along with Stack Trace and Memory, who are, you know, friends of mine who live here in my city, and Memory is my best friend in the whole world, um, we, we now work as a unit. So it was just like, the, it, anyway, I don't, I don't want to get too... Um, you know, uh, nostalgic or, or emotional or romantic about all this stuff. But for, for a while, I was like, wow, I kind of started figuring it out. And I'm like, this is so much easier than the business because I'm working directly with artists, mm-hmm. you know, licensing beats. They can message me at any time of the day and I can respond to them. We can talk. Um, you know what I'm saying? We, whatever, whatever questions they need, I can try to help. And then if they want a track, we negotiate directly if they need to, or they just buy it straight off the page. And I don't have to wait six months to get this money. It's there. Right. And so for a while, I was just like, what is it? I don't, I see why these online dudes don't give a fuck about the industry. Right. Because right. why yeah. would they? And so you have all the industry dudes looking at the internet guys like, uh, you'll never make any money. Because they they're suffering so much in that space you know with with, with the industry was like i would make a thousand beats and five of them would get placed that's a horrible ratio and psychologically my you you know my my ego was crushed because it's like i'm being rejected at such a high rate yeah exactly exactly yeah. And now I'm and and you wouldn't you don't even get feedback. They don't even say, <laughs> "Yeah, I don't like this beat. Um try something like that." It's just it's just you don't hear back from them. And so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. After, if I can, uh, if know, I can interject for one second. Yeah. I went into the studio with Meek Mill one time and uh I got the opportunity to go to a studio and play him beats. And I pulled into the parking lot and he was pulling out of the parking lot as I pulled in. And I was like, Oh, "Oh, this isn't, this isn't starting good. And no, I mean, this is, and again, this is not any kind of a 
statement on him. What the fuck? It's not his responsibility to know when I'm yeah. going to be there. You know, it was just, I was just like, oh, oh no. Like, oh gosh. So I go in and they're like, yeah, I just went to dinner. So, you know, you can either hang out or whatever. And I was like, well, I'll hang out. You never know. So I was just working on beats and stuff. And I basically waited a really long time, went in, played him a bunch of beats in like five minutes. He's rapping. I'm like, oh, this is going to be amazing. And then they're done. It's like, all right, man, thanks for coming. See ya. And that was it. And that's just that's just the way yeah. she goes. You know? Well, Sorry, and, I, and I had uh, um, no, my man Compound had a session with him, and he's sending me iPhone videos of Meek uh, recording a track to, to one of my beats that I made, and I was like, oh, I need to get this to Meek. And I was like, this is perfect. This is going exactly as planned. And then, you know, he he caught that stupid ass uh, probation violation thing <laughs> yeah and yeah. that was it there goes the record and i'm like there okay it well it's way worse for him because he's he's exactly he's, on, he's, he's back in jail because he was riding yeah. a bike but it's you know still still you're like oh so man. anyway yeah <laughs> yeah but that that kind of stuff happens all the time so then when we finally started getting back into um the placements and i got like five maybe in the, in the last year out of nowhere you know it was like i didn't get any for a year or two because i was so focused on the online so, or maybe i did but it was artists i was working with more directly like i love working with strange music love working with royce the five nine but and and you know no the joe button that was before um but then it's like all of a sudden i'm realizing wait now i gotta wait for this advance now i have to be told that the song might not even come out because they they liked it a year ago and now they're about to release it and they don't think it sounds current it's like oh yeah why am i i'm just going I'm, let me go back to beat stars i mean i, yeah, I don't think know, that, that's <laughs> such a that's such a good point too because that i can't maybe name it off the top of my head but making something and having someone sort of um well without naming the artist or the label because i don't want to stir up negativity an artist, um, you know, they had a song, they loved it. It was really cool. And, uh, they were, the, the label was like, yeah, this is going to be a single, you know, we're going to promote this. We're going to really do this, but we need you to chill on it. We don't want you to play it. We don't want you to perform it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to do, we're going to do this the right way. I know and where this they, is going. <laughs> and they went out and toured and did all this shit. And then it's like a lot of time passes and the label's like, nah, we're not really feeling this. And it's like, why didn't you just release it or allow me to perform? You know, why now, of course you don't like it now. It's 10 months later. Like it's, it sounded really fresh 10 months ago. Of course it doesn't sound fresh right now. You know? So they were really, really frustrated. It was horrible. And I you never got paid, never came out, nothing, you know? I got some labels that owe me some money because a song wouldn't come out. I get half of the advance and then all of a sudden it's out like 10 years later on a streaming platform and I'm getting copyright claims. Like this is just things like that really frustrate me. But the reason I'm not such a pessimist right now about it is because I have the online um, brand. Right. And thank God I did that. Because when I was focusing, just like you were saying, when I was focusing on being the guy that's producing for the industry dudes, I, I left so much on the table for myself in terms of my own visibility and my own branding and becoming somebody that could exist without anybody else's cosign. And, you know, nowadays it's like a given. You brought up Kenny Beat's name. Nowadays it's a given. Um producers are brands and the ones that that aren't brands either they're just absolutely killing it behind the scenes like you're a jetson or you know whoever right right, right. or you're frustrated because yeah. you're not getting your credit and you're not getting your placement and you might not be getting uh, many sales online because nobody knows who you are and they don't trust you as a brand so right i that's a lesson i wish i would have really internalized back when i was a kid when i was 18 19 20 um, cause yeah, it's, it's, I'm not the guy that's going to say it's too late for somebody in their thirties to figure that out. It's not, no. um, but it's, it's harder because of the psychology behind it. You have more to lose now and you're a lot more cautious when, when you, when you get older. So maybe, I mean, maybe you're not, I don't know, but you know, I hear from a lot of people, I got kids, I got family. It's like, yeah, but right. I, what, what, what can I say? 
that's kind of my thing is maybe I wasn't able to nurture that artist brand thing, but I was able to get into a little, and I'm not like making a living. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I was able to get into not like, like uh, commercial music or film TV ish kind of stuff. And that was kind of a, a cool thing for me because I was, it, it, I mean, it's a weird world. You have to move really f- insanely fast. You really need to have a library of stuff and be able to, to manipulate it and change it really quickly. But it's the opposite. I mean, it, it, you find out immediately. You know what I mean? Like if you go, go in for a commercial, they don't waffle for six months. They tell you mm-hmm. in 48 hours. Um, yeah. And that, it's, that's, that, even if you don't get it, you might get paid a demo fee. You know what I mean? So it's like it's, you're, you feel like you're working, producing work. You're happy with it. You're paid for your time. It's a win-win. You know what I mean? Instead of just throwing songs, just endless beats, like down into a hole that no one ever listens to them or whatever. You know what I mean? Okay. I have, I have two questions. They're kind of bigger questions, but I, I'll end after that. because Right on, yeah. Um, but So uh, the one question is, it's a hell of a question. How did you get into the whole, you know, TV, film, um, music licensing space? And then I'll I'll ask the second question. Okay, cool. That. Yeah, I, I now this is, you know, everything that I've ever done is a third luck, a third work, and a third. I mean. It's it's luck. It's just luck. Like it's hard work, but then it has to line up, and that the way that it lines up is often luck. So, for example, um, back maybe five years ago, they did a major laser cartoon. It was on the FX network. It's called FXX. It's kind of like that joke from Dodgeball about all the ESPN. It was like an FX that just showed The Simpsons all the time or something. Anyways, uh, they made an Adult Swim style major laser cartoon and aired it on fxx and um i have just shit loads of music you know what i mean like music lying around like music that i had submitted to other major laser projects and they were like hey this will work you know this is good like we can use this we can do background stuff so i ended up um providing beats that were then used by other artists um i i'm i've worked with trinidad james a lot at the time so he and i did some stuff for the show i've worked with Riff Raff from day i've been working with Riff Raff since 2011 he's my bro i love him i mean he we really are super tight uh me and Riff Raff did an amazing tune um called uh, double cup he was a character on the show so that kind of like got that ball rolling and then for example uh, a while after that Andy Samberg from The Lonely Island and Saturday Night mm-hmm. Live and that show Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, he had done some work on the Major Lazer show, and he was doing that movie Pop Star, which was, it was good, but it, it, a lot of people didn't see it. Uh, he was like a Justin Bieber-ish pop star guy with tattoos, and it was like a, a mockumentary, you know, Spinal Tap pop star guy. And so he was doing music. And uh, I, the publishing arrangement that I had at the time were like, hey, can we submit some music to him? I was like, absolutely. And they were like, well, what can we tell him? Like, who, what, you know, what's the deal? And I, I said, well, don't forget the major laser thing that he was a part of. So I never spoke to him. I don't know anything about him. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But my understanding was he was like, oh, cool. I loved that project. Let me hear this stuff. And he ended up doing a song with Chester Bennington from Linkin Park on the soundtrack for Popstar. So, I mean, wow. that's if that's not luck nothing else is but it was also just having an arsenal of stuff having a library being able to change it being going oh you want something like that cool well let me you know kind of flip it a little bit but it was luck too but it but it the the things kind of fall that way and it was like oh this guy was a good part of that project he wasn't an asshole you know what i mean like we like him cool and then they maybe ask you back you know yeah and then you know those people don't just work for what the the music supervisors at FX have more than one show they might switch to another network they might be working for an agency who knows and and you're the guy that gave them a good experience they're going to come back to you so i did a commercial it was like an instagram commercial i don't know i think it was maybe like a story or something but it was for express the um store like the you know the mall store i mean everybody, yeah. everybody knows express um and I mean, I got it because I was quick, I was easy to work with, and I responded to their notes and their desires immediately. And they were like, this is, this is, we're very, very happy. This is great. You know, this is what we want. We want your 
expertise. That's why we're coming to you to make music. But then we want to work with you and we don't want you to be a, you know, you can't have that like obsession. You can't not want to change stuff. I've been in pop sessions in the past where I was not as experienced and I was younger and I was a jerk and I didn't know how to transpose the key of my song fast enough. And so I would be like, no, we don't need to change the key. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong way to be. I don't even want to name, I mean, this is a huge pop writer I was with. And she was like, will you change the key? And I didn't change it. That's wrong. That's not how you should be. You have to, you can't be so obsessed that what you made is so special that you're not ready to change the tempo in half or um, change the key. I think one of my favorite tracks from the last five or 10 years was a Kanye produced a track for that Rick Ross record where he had like the paint face on the cover. And I think it started from a DJ Mustard beat, but he like slowed it down. It's just a really cool song. And I can imagine how it changed along the lines. I can, I can imagine DJ Mustard sending him a Mustard beat and Kanye writing something and then changing it and flipping it and then changing, uh, slowing it down and pitching it there, whatever. Um, in the past, it was one of my biggest mistakes to be all way too married to that stuff. So yeah, that, that goes back to being versatile. I think that's really what being versatile is all about.